Don't go anywhere. The St. Lucie County Sheriff's Office is about to go 10 8. Welcome to 10-8, your inside view of the St. Lucie County Sheriff's Office. I'm your host, Sergeant Chris Sissio. Today we're joined by Major Pat Ty. He is the Director of Detention for the St. Lucie County Sheriff's Office. He has 33 years of law enforcement experience. Major Ty, welcome to the show. Thank you, Chris. Tell us a little bit about your experience, how you got involved in law enforcement, and what ultimately brought you here to St. Lucie County. Well, a considerable amount of years ago, I started my career in the Department of Corrections for the state of Massachusetts. Mm -hmm. um, Almost immediately thereafter, I accepted employment with the Broward County Sheriff's Office as a deputy sheriff and worked my way up through the ranks. Retired as a lieutenant colonel of the de uh, Department of Detention and took a job with Ken Mascara as a director of the Department of Detention for St. Lucie County. Now, how long ago did you come here to St. Lucie um, County? 2002. 2002, very good. So we're working on uh, quite a number of years here now. Yes. Um, what are your responsibilities as the director of detention rank of major at the jail? Well, first and foremost is to keep the prisoners safe and secure, mm -hmm. snug in their beds. Yes. Um, but of course you have vast responsibilities of, of getting people transported from throughout the state to attend court, mm -hmm. um, getting um, first appearance done every day from the arrests that were made in the, f the previous 24 hours, um, all the medical, mental health, dental attention for the inmates, the food. Uh, mm -hmm. we, we, we serve over 6,500 meals a day at the wow. jail. Wow. Um, Along with that, um, our inmates in the kitchen also cook 400 meals a day for the Meals on Wheels program. Mm -hmm. It's one of the only counties in the state that does that. And it's, 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 they're grateful they can help and, and give back to society. Right. Now, you mentioned about transporting prisoners throughout the state. There must be a vast network of transports that take place. You know, we're going to different places um, such as Stark and, and pretty much all over the state for that. I mean, that takes a tremendous amount of coordination. Yes. Um, Last year, I believe, we traveled over 25,000 miles and transported wow. over 19,000 prisoners. Wow. And how big is the transportation unit? Seven individuals. Seven individuals. So they're responsible for moving these people all over the state, maybe moving them from the detention facility to the courthouse. Yes. And then back in some, some instances? Yes. And federal prisoners also, back and forth to Miami. Now tell us about the federal prisoner program that we have. Um, we have a contract with the federal marshals. As you know, Fort Pierce recently built and opened a federal courthouse. Mm -hmm. um, with that, we took the opportunity to accept U.S. Marshal prisoners that are being charged in federal court, um, and the county gets $85 per day per inmate while we hold them. Wow, very good. What kind of population um, are we looking at at the St. Lucie County Jail? Right now, we're averaging about 1,220 prisoners on any given day. Um, what the public doesn't know is we have 360 mental health patients today largest mental health provider on the Treasure Coast, mm -hmm. and we're not a mental health hospital. We have um, 82 murderers in custody, or attempted murderers. I, I uh, classify attempted murderers the same as murderers, mm -hmm. only because we have a very good trauma center in St. Lucie County. Right. Um, we have over 100 gang members in custody. Mm -hmm. You know, we've had a lot of gang violence in Fort Pierce, and the law enforcement agencies have done a very good job of trying to control that violence. Mm -hmm. But one setback of that is the jail receives all those prisoners. Right. So you're putting all of those elements into one location, and it's your job to keep them safe in their beds, mm -hmm. but also to provide a safe work environment for the deputy sheriffs that work under your command. Right. And that's, that's a pretty significant task. It's, it's significant. <laughs> um, and if you looked at it from a, a law enforcement police perspective, and we looked at what a deputy controls in the community in a zone, the jail has the highest density of criminals of any zone in any area in St. Lucie County, and we have to do it without any weapons and right. control it. Wow, that's, uh, that's amazing. And, and to be able to do so while with it being cost effective, yes. um, minding the budget, minding the, the, the recent budget crises that we faced over the last seven, eight years, um, and try to pull it off and, and, and accomplish the goals of keeping the prisoners safe, keeping the deputies safe, and ultimately the community safe. Absolutely. 
Wow. I know that we've got special programs that we offer at the jail, and, and we have with us also today in the next segment, um, Captain Bill Lawhorn. He's going to talk a little bit more about the program. So we thank you for being on the show. Um, you sure. know, we look forward to having you again in the future to tell us about some of the other programs that we're going to be starting off at the St. Lucie County Jail. Sure. Um, when we return, we will be meeting with Captain Bill Lawhorn. He is the division commander for the Department of Detention. Don't go away. You won't want to miss it. We'll be right back. Welcome back to 10-8. We are now joined by Captain Bill Lawhorn. He is the Division Commander for the Department of Detention at the St. Lucie County Sheriff's Office. He himself has 24 years of law enforcement experience that brings him to the position he's at today. Captain, welcome to the show. Thank you for having me. It's a pleasure to be here. Tell us a little bit about your experience, how you got involved in law enforcement, and what brought you here. Oh, uh, back in 1989, I started my career with the Broward County Sheriff's Office. Um, I went in as a Deputy Sheriff working in the Department of Detention. I worked there, worked my way up through the ranks. Um, uh, until 2007. I left there as a major, um, mm -hmm. decided to um, make a personal choice, left the state of Florida for several years. Uh, family and I moved to the state of Vermont, in which I took over as a director of security and then ultimately um, running the entire state uh, prison system. Wow. Um, in May of 2013, I returned to Florida to come work for Ken Mascara uh, as the assistant director over the Department of Detention here. Well, we're, we're happy to have you. It's warmer weather. Yes, yes, it, from Vermont, <laughs> yes. Yeah. Uh, similar to what you encountered in Broward County. So Absolutely. A lot less traffic, though. Yes. Um, you specifically, in your responsibilities as the division commander there, are responsible for certain inmate programs. That's correct. Tell us a little bit about some of those programs. Well, in, uh, in the Department of Detention, um, you know, everybody has a vision of the jail as being somewhere to lock prisoners away. Um, here in St. Lucie, we, we have several programs in which we're getting the inmates involved in, um, not necessarily just to... Um, appease the inmate population, but also to help them change so when they do come out into society, um, maybe it'll prevent the next victim um, of a crime. Mm -hmm. Well, and, and recidivism rate is very important. The, the programs that are offered to inmates are pretty closely scrutinized by members of the public. Yes. And the focus of the program, like you said, is not so much that the inmate benefits, although that is important, but you know, we do not want them to reoffend. We don't want to have to spend taxpayer money having them back into the jail again after reoffending several months later. That's correct. And you know, there's, those programs are of a tremendous value to both the inmate and the public overall. It is, and w what we've seen um, inside the jail, you know, w when you look at the general population recidivism rate, it's about 38%. Mm -hmm. um, when we start looking at our programs, we have a GED program, substance abuse program, or spiritual dorm. Um, we look at the recidivism rate of those programs, it's about 17%. Wow, so much um, lower. We, well, you know, I'll do one better. We have a culinary arts program, which the inmates get in, they start to learn a trade, um, in which you know, they get national certifications. Um, that recidivism rate has reduced out of 10% right. of a return rate, which is fantastic. Well, let's talk a little bit about the spiritual dorm. We'll just okay. talk about some of these programs specifically. What is their focus? What's that program about? So the spiritual dorm is for individuals who um, can live together in a dorm, um, and they're looking for a higher power or, or trying to find roots with themselves um, and what their spirituality is, right. uh, whether it's uh, a Christian belief or a Jewish belief or even a Muslim belief. Mm -hmm. um, they can get together, they can talk together, they can pray together, um, they can share one another's um, belief. They'll have a mutual respect for the differences between the two. Uh, between you know, the different religions. Right, and we have volunteer chaplains that actually come in and help in the spiritual dorm, you know, um, serving them in their needs, correct? That we do. We have, we have hundreds from around the community, mm -hmm. um, all denominations that come in and actually support us. In fact, recently we just held an appreciation luncheon mm -hmm. for the clergy. Uh, yeah. It was attended by uh, two to 300 clergy um, yeah. from around the community. The sheriff came in, um, really thanked them. And it, it's our appreciation for the volunteer work that they do. Yeah, and it's tremendous because you know, being that they're volunteers, these chaplains don't get paid to come in. They come in their own time you know, out of concern for the inmates to, again, try to keep them from reoffending, but also to give them something of value when they come out of the jail. Agreed, and that, and that, that is our ultimate goal. Yeah. Now, what about the substance abuse programs? Substance abuse programs, we have two of them. Uh, we have one for males, we have one for females. Um, and talking with the individuals who are participants, this is one of the most intensive programs. You know, most jail uh, facilities and even in the community, they have substance abuse programs. Um, and talking to the participants, uh, this is one of the most challenging ones mm -hmm. because it, it does start to, um, pinpoint the 12-step program and really makes them um, become self-aware of right. what their problems are, admit that they, they have a, an abuse, uh, substance abuse problem, um, and makes them focus on how to get better, how to really focus on themselves, um, how it has traumatized others in their life. Um, so hopefully they, they can 
avoid the temptations once they return to the community. Right. There's a GED program as well, I there understand, is out at the jail. So we're involved in, um, you know, those people who are searching for education. That's correct. Um, a basic education, if you will, um, or general a, education. A lot of individuals that we encounter in the jail um, are high school dropouts. Mm -hmm. um, we give them an opportunity to go back to school, um, learn, get their education level, so they, they will walk away, um, hopefully with the GED, mm -hmm. um, in hopes of obtaining employment once they get out. Right, and hopefully that employment will keep them from reoffending. So Again, all with the, the same goal. goal. Yes, all with the same goal. And you had mentioned uh, the recidivism rate in the in the culinary arts program um, being so low, ten percent. What is it? First of all, tell us about the culinary arts program, and was it what is it about that that you think keeps the recidivism rate so low? The culinary arts program is run um, by our contracted uh, food service vendor, which is Aramark. Mm -hmm. um, I think that it is it is a very um, professional approach to. Um, a program. Mm -hmm. It's we, we start to recognize one. We we get them a national certification through uh, uh, ServeSafe, mm -hmm. um, which they can take once they leave us and actually get employment um, in a restaurant. A lot of restaurants want somebody who have that certification. Right. Um, and it'll help them save money from having to send them themselves. But in the program, uh, we recognize um, all the the safe food handling. Uh, we give them different. Um, uniforms to wear. So you got culinary uniforms mm -hmm. and with each stage they get a different color hat. Um, so as they're an apprentice um, they get a certain color hat and as they achieve certain ranks you know so it's almost like a step program right. that they can work their way through and it's a personal achievement that they, that they get. In each of these programs um, we do do some community events like at the clergy luncheon mm -hmm. that we, we just talked about. Um, the All the meals prepared by the culinary um, mm -hmm. arts program um, it is served so they're actually giving back to the community at that point. Yeah. Um, we also did a Dancing with Pal recently mm -hmm. in which this culinary arts program presented the food, was able to go out, serve it um, in full chef garbs. Mm -hmm. So as they're presenting, they're giving back. Um, not everybody in, in the participation knew that they were inmates. Right. So they can see what they're doing, how they're preparing it, right. and kind of get some self-appreciation for what they've Absolutely. accomplished. And they don't have the embarrassment of being in prison or jail outfits. Correct. And, and, and that creates a level of value in them. It does. That, you know, I've learned a skill. The, the, the society or the jail has helped me learn a skill. I'm able to use that skill. I'm successful in using that skill, thus with the goal of hopefully not reoffending. Absolutely. Wow. Very informational. We thank you for being on the show and welcome again this year to the St. Louis County Sheriff's Office. Well, thank we, you very we much. We hope to see you in the near future on the show. Uh, when we return, we're going to talk crime prevention with crime prevention specialist Russ Cullum. You don't want to miss this. Don't go away. Welcome back to 10-8. We're joined now by crime prevention specialist Russ Cullum. Russ, what's going on in the crime prevention world? So, Arch, today we're going to talk about the holiday season. Okay. It's fast approaching, obviously, it's the first week of December. Um, we're going to talk about preventing tips and how to keep your family safe. And also, uh, hopefully you have a good holiday season. The first thing uh, we're going to talk about is lighting. Lighting. Everybody likes dressing their houses up. Mm -hmm. Yep. And the biggest thing people forget is overloading the circuit breaker yeah. or the system, mm -hmm. or they buy multiple power strips. Yeah. And they use one power strip, go down the road, get another power strip, and just keep going around the house. And they don't realize that that's pulling a draw, which could cause a fire. Absolutely, absolutely. And we do not want to see that happen. Also, while they're putting up their lights, look at the quality of the wire. Mm -hmm. Make sure the wire's not been pinched, the protective covering is, is missing. Right. Because that, that, again, opens you up to a possibility of a, a problem, a well, situation, yeah, absolutely. a fire. Absolutely. And fire, fire tends to happen quite a bit at Christmas because of all the lighting and the power surge issues and, and all of this. Uh, putting lights on dying trees. Correct. You know, yeah, I mean, and people then, don't think about that, but that becomes a problem. Or even leaving your Christmas tree leaf on while they go out. Right. A live tree, you know could go up depending on what lights they have. Now what about placement of gifts? I know that you know people like to put their gifts, some people like to put their gifts out early and you know, of course they leave their <laughs> windows open so that the public can see the lighting scheme that they've got inside, but what kind of crime prevention does that pose, problem does that pose with you know leaving that stuff visible for the people on the outside? A big opportunity. Absolutely. You don't put your Christmas tree, although everybody likes to do it because we're in Florida, we have sliders, mm -hmm. put your Christmas tree in front of your sliding door. And the biggest all, window. Yeah. Yep, and put yeah. all the presence underneath that, you're just asking for trouble. If you want to do that, close your blinds. Yeah. Don't, when you're home, open it. But even that still gives the opportunity for somebody to see 
what's in your house or there's gifts there. Right. And I know that we're getting into the Christmas season and, you know, I hate to be a bummer and start talking about closing out the holiday season. But, you know, when people open their presents and, and they close their boxes and they put all the boxes for the big screen TVs out by the trash and they put all the, the boxes for the, the Wii and all the, the different technology, what should they do with that stuff before they put it outside by the well, trash? Well, as you just explained, that's advertisement. As, advertisement. Yes. Look, look what I just got. What they need to do is cut up the boxes and either put them in a trash can or cover them up in the recyclables, but put them so it's not just putting out the box. Right. Saying, I got a 55 inch screen television. Yeah, come in and take it because nobody's home. As right, because you see, you see all those cars in driveway. Right, absolutely. absolutely. So cut them up, either put them in a, a, a black trash bag mm -hmm. or cut them up small enough to put in your recycle bins. And, and get them get them out that way. Don't don't leave them out in the open advertising. Right. And, and all of this is about just removing the opportunity for the criminal to see it, really. You and, know. and unfortunately, that, that's what happens. We, we become crimes of opportunities. Absolutely. Shopping malls. Mm -hmm. Well, let's let's move into that. Let's talk about out and about safety. You know, okay. when people are out there shopping and what should they be paying attention to crime prevention related while they're shopping for the season? Well, the biggest thing I'd say, the more the merrier. The more people go shopping together, the better you're off. Mm -hmm. um, park in a well-lit area. Don't leave anything of valuable in your car year round, not only during the holiday season. Yeah. Um, when you, if you go to one store and you're loaded down with gifts, one, have your key ready to get in your trunk. Hopefully you'll put everything in the trunk, secure it. And if you're gonna go to another store, move your car around the mall. Mm -hmm. So people think you're leaving in case they're out there watching you in the parking lot. Right. right. Well, it, it seems to make sense, and these are such simple tips, but again, with the rush, and, and, and not that the holiday season is any more of a rush, but I guess I guess you could consider it as such. These are things that people can do year-round. When they go to the beach Absolutely. and they put their purse in the trunk, well, they, they park at the beach access, open up the trunk, put the purse in the trunk, go to the beach, come back, find that their trunk has been broken into and wonder, how did they know I put my stuff in the trunk? Well, just like you mentioned at the mall, people are casing the beach accesses, looking for that opportunity same thing with the mall when they walk out with the 55 inch tv put it in the back of the suv and then go back in because they forgot something or need to get more and come out out and the stuff's gone exactly and and they people are watching us and and they're out in the park a lot they're looking for that app opportunity one thing i will say is if you're approached as you're going to your vehicle don't resist mm -hmm. don't get yourself in a vulnerable situation where you can get hurt right what you should do is just get a good description of the individual that took your belongings, the direction of travel, and immediately have somebody notify 911 so we can get there and respond. Absolutely. Your life is not worth what you're carrying in your hands. Absolutely not. Absolutely not. Well, Russ, we thank you for coming on the show again. We hope that you have a wonderful holiday season. Uh, for more information on these or other programs that we have at the Sheriff's Office, please visit us at stlucysheriff.com. When we come back, we'll be meeting with Sheriff Ken Mascara. Don't go away. Welcome back to 10-8. We're joined now by Sheriff Ken Mascara. Boss, welcome back to the show. Thank you, Sergeant. Uh, some new things happening around the Sheriff's Office. We just kicked off recently a new budget year. That is correct. Uh, so tell October us a little 1st. bit about that. Yep. October 1st uh, starts our fiscal year uh, this year. Um, we enter it with uh, great enthusiasm because uh, the Board of County Commissioners approved a 3% across the board pay raise for our employees, mm -hmm. which was uh, well needed. It's been six years since they had a raise. Uh, so um, we're, we're quite excited. Good deal. Good deal. I know the deputies are excited about that, and uh, you know, of course, they've worked very hard during the uh, the difficulty with the economy. But uh, by all means, you know, a little bit of a raise goes a long way. That is correct. Goes a long way. Um, we also have coming up the holidays, and the sheriff's office has historically participated in a program called Christmas Families. Can you tell us a little bit about that and what our involvement is with this program? Well, the school resource deputies have actually uh, embraced this program and kept it going for so many years. Uh, their deputies in the school resource uh, unit identify uh, children within the schools that are needy. They bring those uh, names back to the sheriff's office and uh, we, uh, for lack of a better word, adopt those children and their families for Christmas. Uh, the community uh, gives us uh, a tremendous amount of support in the way of donated toys. And then uh, as an agency, we wrap those toys up, uh, give it back to the school resource deputies to uh, take to the families that have been identified. And uh, not only the toys, but we also uh, throw in there some uh, 
food coupons or public gift cards. So not only do the, does the child receive something or children receive something, mm -hmm. the family has uh, the assets to go make a great Christmas right. dinner. What kind of feedback do you get from that program? Oh, it's <coughs> absolutely awesome. Uh, the people that donate the items uh, really buy in and feel so much uh, gratitude to be able to do that. And then the families that are the recipient uh, of this uh, goodwill uh, are just overcome yeah. uh, with joy and uh, share that with us. I remember uh, it's probably been about five or six years ago, uh, my daughter and I, and uh, at the time she was maybe 14 or 15, my daughter and I uh, stopped and had coffee at a Dunkin' Donuts uh, on her way to high school. Mm -hmm. And uh, a lady came up and introduced herself as one of the recipients oh, wow. uh, from our Christmas families. And she went on to say that uh, her small children would not have wow. had a Christmas that year. And uh, my daughter actually began to cry and, and yeah. just couldn't believe the impact that this program has on uh, families. Well, what a good way to touch the community, oh. to, sh to show the, uh, the spirit of giving. And many of these people who give the gifts to the sheriff's office for us to give out don't even want to be recognized. They that is correct. They do it out of the goodness of their heart. They don't want to be noticed. That um, is just, correct. Just in the spirit of giving, it, it seems to work really well. By their giving, they are receiving, yes. and uh, it's, it's an awesome, uh, awesome thing for our community to do that. Yeah. You know, we come to that point in the show where we've got um, viewer questions. Um, mm -hmm. These pretty much come from our Facebook page that we have. Uh, the first question comes from um, Nady Jean, and the question is, do you believe having St. Lucie County good behavior inmates working around areas of Fort Pierce will reduce crime rate because it can bring awareness towards the community? Well, that is a great question, and not only do I think having inmates uh, work around the community can reduce crime, uh, but it's a great way of saving taxpayers money. Mm -hmm. uh, the calendar year 2012, inmates uh, put in approximately uh, just under 60,000 hours of community service uh, within our community, and at a very modest $12 an hour, that's just under a qu uh, three quarters of a million dollars mm -hmm. that uh, would have had to been paid either through uh, to subcontractors or other individuals to perform this work. Yeah. So uh, we utilize our uh, low-risk inmates daily. There's teams that go, in that, uh, go out in our community and uh, perform uh, functions uh, for governments and schools and uh, nonprofits that otherwise uh, they would have to pay for that. Mm -hmm. And just recently um, you had hosted um, in conjunction with a local church a, a clergy appreciation luncheon uh, for the local clergy that volunteer for the sheriff's office to actually minister to the inmates. That is correct. So that's another way that we can actually give back and, and help out as well. That is correct. Um, the other question that we have is from uh, Gene Moore Jr. who writes, with this being a technology age, how is the sheriff's office utilizing technology to assist in solving crimes and protecting its citizens? Well, the new saying is Bonnie and Clyde used a gun to rob banks, and now our criminals are using computers yeah, and information <laughs> technology. So uh, being at the forefront of uh, technology is a, uh, a big uh, push for me. Last year, we uh, implemented our new intelligence-led policing. It's now up and running in full force. And uh, I'm sure you could attest that uh, the information that we're receiving just uh, top notch. Mm -hmm. uh, it's shared throughout the agency. Uh, so any of that information that we could uh, use to um, identify crimes before they happen or solve crimes after they happen, uh, we have in place. And wow. it's going to be a game changer. Yep, absolutely. And we only look forward with technology advancements. I think every 18 months, you know, yes. things just, they just, just grow and grow mm -hmm. astronomically. You know, we can only look forward to uh, better changes coming up in the future. That is correct. Well, Sheriff, as always, we thank you for being on the show. Glad to be here. For more information about these programs, please visit us at stlucysheriff.com or follow us on any of our social media sites. Until next time, stay safe and thanks for watching.